Well, hello. Welcome to the premier podcast of Coomer and Cormorant's Corner, where we will be discussing a series of talk topics and issues concerning faith and everyday life. The title of today's topic is Religion and Politics, Can They Mix? But before we start, let's hear a little bit about each of our hosts. Father Coomer? Well, hello, I'm Father Bill Coomer, as you may have heard from the introduction. I've been a priest of this diocese of Fort Wayne South Bend for uh, 48 years, and uh, in the course of that time I've been intrigued by many uh, different sorts of uh, topics, and over the years I've engaged in, uh, I wouldn't want to say friendly, but perhaps uh, pointed conversations with uh, Father Corman, and at his invitation he thought we should uh, do something uh, on uh, on uh, public uh, media, as it were. Uh, my uh, thought was he was going to run a little uh, uh, audio tape and we'd talk into it, but I arrived here at his uh, luxurious studio and <laughs> find there's a camera in the corner. So to all of you who are watching and listening, uh, welcome uh, to the case on the corner. Father Corman. Hey, great. I've been a priest of this diocese for 31 years. It's great. More fun than a human being should be allowed to have. And yes, I would concur with Father Coomer. We've had some uh, animated conversations at times. Um, and we always, uh, we come down on the same side, I think, more or less. Uh, and mostly more than less. I, I really believe that. Although it may not seem so at times. <laughs> uh, regardless of that, um, it's great to be here. And what are the two things that we're told to never talk about? Faith religion and politics. And Father Coomer had suggested that we talk about religion and politics. So his was the, uh, the idea for our preliminary podcast, the first one, episode one. So Father Coomer, what is politics? How do you define it? Well, I need to offer one more preliminary comment uh, in terms of temperament. Uh, <laughs> Father Coomer will tend to be more animated and uh, involved uh, shall we say, uh, emotionally, uh, then you will find me. So uh, we have the, uh, well, but how about this one, uh, Glenn? Uh, how about fire and ice? You like that? <laughs> <laughs> good. So the question you pose is, what is politics? Well, I think it's the uh, human uh, endeavor to uh, gain uh, control and power, in a way. Mm -hmm. Father Corman. Well, someone had said the etymology for politics was poly means many and ticks blood-sucking animals, although that is not the actual etymology of politics. Politics in its tense come from the idea of polis, or the center of the city, and it's the way in which hopefully we can gain people together that can give proper governance and, uh, and good, a good framework for a stable social environment. And that's really the goal of politics, to help people get along in a social environment in peaceful and tranquil ways. So on the other side then, Father Corman, what is your definition of religion? The etymology, re means again, and religion comes from the word to connect. So fundamentally, foundationally, religion is the means to reconnect to our relationship with God, to reconnect with that, that, that reality that exists. So oftentimes, as from the Judeo-Christian tradition, that relationship was severed through original sin. And religion is the means that God has revealed to his people in various forms and various aspects to reconnect and make that connection once again to our creator. So Father Coomer, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, it sounds like, a, uh, uh, I don't want an engineer's perspective <laughs> on something that's not quite so complicated. Uh, religion uh, for me simply is a, uh, a building of a conduit that uh, we can touch God and God can touch us, you know. It's the uh, effort that the Lord has uh, given to his people to be in contact with him and vice versa. So that sounds like religion is God and his people and, the, and politics is the government and the people. But does the church have anything to say about politics, Father Coomer? Oh, I got <laughs> that it does, I suppose. Uh, my uh, thing is much uh, too simple for the uh, profound uh, documents and teachings. 
you know it that every year, even here in the United States, our bishops uh, offer uh, statements and commentary on the life of Fathers in America. But for me, I just like to quote my uh, uh, beloved and deceased mother, uh, who said more times than I can remember now that one ought to uh, say kind things about one another or keep your mouth shut. And that's my uh, goal in my life, to help our political people to keep in mind that the goal is the uh, a common good, the welfare of the people, and not to be uh, a, a boxing rink or a, uh, a place of argumentation. I know that's important, I suppose, in some perspectives, uh, but I think the church wants us to be uh, attentive to God's word and the scripture and our political activity uh, to further and protect the common good. Father Corman. You know, <clears throat> politics is about the social order, and one can articulate or talk about maybe four pillars, and they could be defined differently than this in the Catholic Church's impetus to get along with the world. And so politics would be this means in which these pillars can be protected and enhanced. And the first pillar, above all others, is uh, human dignity. And the church sees every person as being an infinitely valuable, one of a kind masterpiece created by God for a mission. And if we understand that, it will be the means in which we can respect each other, treat each other with great profound respect. And where does this dignity come from? It comes from our faith and belief that Jesus Christ became man. He was truly present among us. So that gives human nature an infinite dignity because Christ shared that nature. And that's why human dignity trumps all, all others. That's number one, because of Christ and him taking on humanity for himself. The second is religious liberty. You cannot impose faith or religion on anyone. It's got to be, if it's going to be real, done in the context of freedom. And so religious liberty is all about giving the people the freedom to believe and practice whatever faith they want to believe and practice. But human dignity really does trump religious liberty. So if someone claims a religion that somehow gives them the license to hurt or defame or attack or besmirch, besmirch some other human being, it's, it's, a, it's an affront against human dignity. That's, so. pre that's precisely the point. I think that the modern, for whatever reason, maybe by training or experience, a modern politician cannot uh, for their human dignity. As a matter of fact, they work very much to point out the, the flaws or the undignified life of their political opponents, I think. No, I would concur. And, and the reason I think that that follows is because there's this quest for power. Yeah, maybe and, it is that and it, and it, it, I don't think politics is fundamentally about power. Now, from a human perspective, that's how it spins out. Politics is always about power. It's about governance. You know, it's about governance. And do we govern from the context of authority or the context of power? We can govern, as you say, uh, from a, a perspective of, of faith, but it, it's not going to work. It's all about, I can tell you what to do. And if you don't do what I do, you're not a good person. Well, and that's the difference between power and authority. If you have power, you have the ability to coerce but a legitimate leader like Christ, as we heard just recently in the, the readings, Jesus spoke with authority. And so what we need to strive for and recognize that when politicians are speaking from the context of what is true, good, and beautiful, they have great authority. When they don't, they still have a lot of power and they can make your life miserable. They and never consider the transcendentalists. What do you mean? You're talking about the politicians that I know or the ones that you dream up in your uh, prayers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand. We're talking about the ideal world here and what we aim to strive to be. Um, but you're right. I mean, that's not how most people live out in the world, and that's not what seems to be motivating most people. But, but for them to find peace and joy in their heart, maybe they can reflect more deeply on, on what really will lead them and the world to a much better existence. There, I think, is the 
uh, insertion of, of religion into politics, uh, it's sort of as a, a gentle and uh, loving uh, teacher. And it plays out in any, uh, any political world, even in, in the church of uh, Glenn Corman. Well, I think it comes back to the point where uh, is it really um, about religion in the sense that I guess what I'm saying is something's not true because the Bible says so. The Bible says so because it's true, all right? So, and that's a faith statement, I know that. But it's very much akin to natural law. And I would argue that even if a person is not religious as such, but is open to understand the mechanisms of nature, the demands of nature, uh, good legislation can be had and can be um, put forth through just insight into natural law. Um, for example, I mean, alcohol is damaging, it impairs one's ability and vision, so there's laws against drunk driving because that's a threat to society. Fundamentally, that, that good law is not rooted in some religious thing that it's a mortal sin to get drunk, which it is, um, but it's rooted in a good, sound understanding of natural law and what's good for humanity and what's good for the social order. So you don't need religion, I would argue, to build a good moral social society because the one, the true and the good and the beautiful are rooted in something outside of any particular religion. We're talking about the intersection of religion in, uh, in the political life. Uh, I'm never going to argue with you about the power of the natural law, but uh, allow me to uh, refer you to this morning's General, General Gazette for an example of how that doesn't always work out too well. Uh, sorry, I missed that. What could you refresh my memory? Oh no, not at all. I just want you to know that in the uh, world that you and I live in, uh, our politicians don't spend their morning hobby discussing the transcendentals. Oh, I don't doubt Thank that you. for a moment. So it, it sounds like you guys are talk, touching on the topic of social justice. How does that intersect with politics? Well, again, I started to describe human dignity and then religious liberty as the first two pillars, which is part of this social justice framework. And the third pillar is something that is so important for us to grasp, which is so easily lost in the hearts and the minds of so many, solidarity. No matter what color we are, no matter what religion we believe, no matter what we think, what language we speak, we are brothers and sisters. We're part of the human family. And that serves us well if we understand solidarity in that sense. And then finally, the fourth pillar is subsidiarity. This is where the socialists get really nervous and the ones they don't really like because it's really bent on trying to empower the people and giving them enough freedom and latitude to solve the problems that are closest to them instead of imposing some kind of one solution fits all. Okay? I mean, so those kind of are the four overreaching pillars of social justice. And these documents and these, these pillars have been really developed over the church's um, social teaching, which really, you can find it in the past, regarding uh, Paul Kanger just wrote a great book on the greatest of indignities about human slavery and how the church from the early ages saw that it wasn't about, you can read the Bible, God gave man dominion over the earth, but he didn't give man dominion over another human being. Okay, so that's kind of implicit in a lot of early church documents, but it becomes much more explicit starting with Rerum Navarum, um, I think that's Leela Gray, in it, and uh, a whole host of other documents that, that talk about how we can integrate and really respect human dignity, those other four pillars that I had mentioned. I'm, I'm talking too much. No, no, you're talking in, uh, back in your world of uh, wonderful idealism, <laughs> but, but unfortunately the church uh, lives, lives in real history, and so uh, we cannot assume that through the courses of the centuries from the early documents of the church uh, from the great theologians of the fourth century until the uh, great theologians of the 20th century uh, that we have not made a few mistakes along the road, uh, even officially and maybe even uh, uh, from the documents themselves. You will agree with at least the possibility of being a little bit uh, off the beam. Well, we're human, inhuman, I like to say. Because if we were only human, we'd be like Jesus. I mean, my, my younger sister came up to me one day and she said, Glenn, I'm only human. 
I said, oh, so you're just like Jesus then, right? Because his human nature is what we aim for, what we strive for. Again, my idealism. But um, we don't sit there and say, cut hell or some slack. We, you, we don't say, cut. Wait, but say that to your sister for heaven's sake. Because I said it to her, and I said, you don't sit there and talk about Hitler and say, oh, give him some slack, he's only human. No, he's inhuman. It's not our humanity that gets us down. It's our inhumanity that gets us down. Uh, and, I agree with that, but... Yeah, so good. I win. You never win. win. That's the problem. Okay. So, so uh, tell me again. I'm only human, and you said to me... Uh, if we were, No, I said if we were only human we would be like Jesus because most people say I'm only human implying that's why I make mistakes that's why I'm so bad because I'm only human no it's our inhumanity that gets us down because if we were only human and fulfill the nature that Christ reflects in his humanity it'd be sweet man the Lord we God, have, we, Lord, the Lord God created humanity and his own image and likeness but I would remind you somewhere along the line the human nature has fallen it has been wounded not decimated but wounded and I All concur the word that we use in, in yeah. theology yeah. <laughs> and so because we're fallen you can be only human and, and uh, use that as an opportunity saying well I can improve sure if you want to you know ignore the redemption and ignore you know the original state which God intended us to, uh, to improve is not an a ignorance or a neglect of redemption it's a part of an morning prayer. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for redeeming Indeed. this fallen nature. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this fallen humanity, if you will. So I'm just saying, and I only speak for myself, but I try and not give myself excuses to screw up. Uh, because with God's grace, you know, we can just continue to move and go in the direction that God would. would so let's we'll go back to the point. Is it not one of the roles of religion or at least religion teachers to provide insight and some direction uh, to the political world. Absolutely. Okay. And because that was my only point. Well and 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 what I'm saying is true religion is in full accord with natural law. And so it is truly helpful, but it's not driven on some blind faith, but it's driven by the faith which through God's grace, hopefully, is in accord with the truth. So, sound governance can be had just by an adherence to the truth. None of us are going to deny the reality of natural law, but all of us, at least this, this person is going to say, although we're in, imbued by God with that natural law, we have a, a pension to uh, ignore it. Absolutely, but I would take issue in the sense that there are a lot of people that don't believe natural law is even real okay they don't yeah, believe you're making a judgment i mean it, it's it's reality it's independent of whether or not i believe it exists and that's good sound philosophy father but a lot of people aren't thinking with good sound philosophy i i mean in the seminary i had a teacher basically say we need to get away from natural law so this, this, this is really about politics so the question is could you be a Democrat and still be a Christian, uh, in your if, opinion? If you vote for candidates that are pro-life <laughs> and you vote for candidates who really uh, have their right order and priority. So, so talking, talking about leaders, um, you know, this kind of goes to that. Do you have to be Christian or religious to be a good leader politically? Who gets the first shot at this? I think I've been talking a lot. Father Coomer. <laughs> What do I know about that? Uh, my uh, bias, of course, is that to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to offer great insight into all aspects of, of our living, even our political uh, uh, interactions and perhaps uh, authority. So, but you don't necessarily have to be. I, many of the Christian philosophers, to use the lens word here, of other ages have looked upon uh, a secular uh, philosophical uh, reasoning to to build things. You know, even uh, our own uh, uh, theology you know, often is spoken of as having some uh, relation to Aristotle, for example. I mean, we, we do uh, try to get the best out of the uh, secular teaching to build our own 
sense of the truth and uh, to teach it as uh, the way it ought to be. Yeah, I think uh, you don't need a religious leader, you know, to survive. I mean, we don't need a theocracy, right? We don't need someone who's animated by religious precepts or laws if that particular leader is just rooted in good, sound philosophy that recognizes the true, the good, and the beautiful. And that's where religion, I think, true religion, really overlaps with these things. So it's where you can propose to these people what is true in the religion, which is a tremendous overlap. I mean, look at, okay, abortion, hot button issue. You have many, many good people who think that it should be a person's right to take out an unborn child, right? I mean, they think that, and many Democrats have that as part of their fundamental platform if you go read it. And so that's akin to having a platform, I would argue, as slavery. There was a time in this country where people thought that it was totally fine to enslave another human being. But through natural insight, which is certainly foundational and clearly evident, and you have a lot of shortcuts that religion gives us to recognize what's true, good, and beautiful, but they recognized that these people had dignity. And it wasn't right for another person to dominate or be over another. And so, same thing with the human being. When you look at a child, which scientifically, it, it's at conception that that person is born and as unique as you or I. And so you have a lot of people who have been deceived and, and not thinking deeply. Uh, my opposition from abortion certainly um, is bolstered by my religious faith, but I would argue that just from natural law, there's atheists, I think it was Bobby, Bobbio, who was an atheist in Rome who came out and was extremely pro-life because he was thinking well. And he didn't see it just as a means of power and control, but of mutual respect and human dignity. Can you think of some examples, um, maybe even biblical, of, of good leaders that weren't Christian? Cyrus. I would argue Cyrus was a great leader. Here, here he was. He saw, presumably, I'm kind of maybe speculating a little bit, but he saw the value of the Jewish people. They had been exiled. And he saw the morality and, and, and the honesty and the integrity. I mean, among the Jewish people, they had to use the same weights and measures. They're following their faith. They had to treat the alien the same as they treat, treated their own. So there wasn't a superiority. So Cyrus seemed to say, this is the kind of people I want in my kingdom. So he helped them reconstruct the temple. And he was, I believe, a Zoroastrian. Okay, he wasn't, wasn't Jewish. So, um, you know, there's, there's great leaders that, that I would argue that, that didn't have the benefit of, say, the Jewish Judeo-Christian faith. I'm a lover of Judeo-Christian faith, but uh, from a personal level, I don't think, and to use a Glenn's word here, a theocracy is not going to be uh, the benefit of the world. Uh, and matter of fact, uh, if we look across our, our history, uh, some of the more uh, fundamental uh, Christian leaders have, in the end, uh, be, become uh, dominant and enslaving uh, their own followers. So I, I'm certainly not a, a believer in the theocracy that that you have to be uh, a god person to be a good leader uh, politically i mean i would like them to to love jesus i would like them to walk uh and teach his way of living and, and care and love of neighbor but I, I i i don't want the ayatollah Khomeini to be the boss of the world even though he's a professed religious leader so what makes somebody a bad leader then Sin. Failure to respect human dignity. Failure to respect religious liberty. Failure to see humanity as a family. And failure to recognize that people have worth and that they don't make some imposed solution one for all. I'll go back to my first word there. It's the power thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It depends on other people. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure you'll be quick to do that if I'm wrong. Of course. Uh, but you know, our Lord said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And I think that is this beautiful understanding of this synthesis of, of faith and reason going together and also church and state, not in opposition to each other. The church will always never be an enemy of the state if the state respects those four pillars. But if the state doesn't, then through 
our faith and our, our obligation. And this is what the church documents say, where we have to become politically involved. The, the document in 1974 on procured, procured abortion said, you know, Catholics need to try and get out there and help the world understand human dignity and say, you know, you can't vote for it. You can't vote for a propaganda campaign in favor of it. And so these things are issues that, that are so powerful. I mean, it takes away a human soul. It, it takes and kills a human being. And, and that's what the church will oppose any state that, that will do that, if they're being true to what the church is teaching. So you've talked a lot about natural law. What is that, Father Coomer? Natural law, in my opinion, simply is the uh, handwriting of God on the human heart that you, you don't have to have a lots of expanded educational experience to know that some things simply don't fit into human life, uh, the human experience of life. So natural law is, is, is God's uh, initial uh, inscription of his message uh, on the human heart. Yeah, not to get technical, you know me, I kind of sometimes get technical. Well, seriously, you don't. Yeah. It's just a great word, which is trying to actually accentuate exactly what you said. Thomas Aquinas would call it cinderesis. If you look into our heart, we can tell what's right and wrong. I'll use an example with my little kids at Mass. I'll go to a little four or five or seven year old and say, would it be right to give your little brother and sister some blocks and go out in the street and play with the blocks in the middle of the busy street? Their eyes get big and they say, no. I said, now did your mother ever tell you not to give your children, your little brother and sister blocks to play in the street? No. <laughs> so they have it written in their heart that they can see what's right and wrong on the big issues. And that's what synderesis is. And that's what natural law really inculcates. You know, it's, it's looking at the laws of nature, how things, how mechanisms work, and what are the ramifications of that. Okay, so um, for example, we have medicine and we understand scientifically what certain medicines do and those medicines can help people profoundly because it's an understanding of nature which can lead to health. Also, we can understand what behaviors are deleterious to the human person. The only reason why something is sinful is because, as I said in blunt terms, it's stupid. All right? I have a t-shirt that says, sin is stupid on the front. and the back it says, don't do stupid. But if you look at it, the reason why God gives us commands is he's trying to protect us from destroying ourselves or destroying those around us. So even outside of the religious context, if one has a good sense of sound science, it will lead to human thriving. And natural law is, is blending our scientific insights and to try and govern behaviors that, that will lead to human health and beauty and goodness and truth. Apart from religion, it's how God has written the truth into nature. From a perspective of, of, of from a religion, we have to learn to be uh, receptive to God's uh, touch and his hand. That makes it easier. Plus, but you have to teach you how to spell, what's that word, secresis? Cinderesis. Cinderesis. I don't know how to spell that. No. But yeah. the point is, even an atheist is subject to the laws of gravity. So, I mean, it, it, natural law is not, I mean, it's, it's God's roadmap, and we see it as such, but even if you don't believe in God, there's still a roadmap that's there. And, and, you know, that's where the contradiction of the atheist is. They have no accounting and can make no sense out of the order of the universe. Where did it come from? I mean, that's why I would argue clearly that it's just we have at least a scientifically plausible explanation for the Big Bang, the order of the universe. Um, God did it. The atheist has no such plausible explanation. They just say it just happened out of nothing. So, you know. Nothing is God for them. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't know that you've uh, or I have made any uh, dent into the uh, world of reality in which uh, religion and, uh, and politics interact, but we know they, that they do, and especially when we're moving into this uh, uh, time of electioneering, uh, we will be uh, hurt by or edified by that interaction. So we keep. We keep believing uh, and keep loving uh, God in all things and uh, have compassion and forgiveness for those who may have uh, 
of opposing political views than our own. And I think what's helpful is if someone has a political view that's contrary to your own, um, I think you can just say, why do you believe that? And, and honestly and genuinely listen to them and invite them to articulate why they think it's a good idea, for example, to kill an innocent unborn child. And then if they ask for your opinion, then grounded in scientific reality of life begins at conception, all these different genetically complete aspects that are so clear and obvious, if they ask you your position, you can explain from sound science why it's a good idea because we wouldn't want someone to kill us, so we don't want to kill someone else, great. But if they don't ask for your opinion, in our co hostile society, I just say, let's pray for each other. So do you, you think if you posed a question like you just did, would, would be perceived as maybe a hostile thing? Is it a good idea to kill, kill an innocent human being? Would that the way you would pose the question? I no. mean, if you wanted to order in some No, of course not. That's, that's not how I would pose the question. All I would right. say... That, that's all I'm saying. You know? Yeah, no, I, I would as say, you know, I said, why do you think abortion's a good idea? You know, and not charge it with those words because clearly you're... But you would have to lead a conversation back to the reality of, of the human person. Exactly. Uh, being fetal life, yeah. If they ask for your opinion. Well, no, you have to do it anyway, because I think the Lord would call us to do that if we just simply talk about it as one more political action, and then, then, then we missed our responsibility. Um, our, our, our objection, or maybe my objection, to destruction of fetal life uh, is not political. <laughs> no, I agree. Okay. I agree. And, and I'm just saying that if someone doesn't ask for your opinion, Okay, I don't think we we're, we have the imposition of I'm just saying it. Chuckling myself uh, over the course of our uh, thirty years of interaction, I've never known you to be shy about arguing your opinion, um, no matter what the question was. Well, that's maybe I'm not there with you all the time. I understand? Well, I mean, in our conversations, because we're basically on the same page. Uh, I think we take yes. sometimes alternate sides just for the fun of articulating and bantering back and forth. But but no, I, I mean, in the hostile, caustic society that we have today, um, I just believe that we don't, we, we, people will not benefit much from our explanation if they don't want to hear it. If they don't ask for your opinion, they probably won't listen to it anyways. But um, you would give it. Uh, uh, generally, I don't think it depends on what context. If we were talking, yes, I would give it. Well, of course. But, but if I'm, I was talking to someone I didn't I'm know, regardless of the context, you, my brother, would give it. Uh, I just think you would. Maybe I don't think so, though. I mean, it, in my in my maturity, in the earlier days, absolutely, I would. Yeah, in my okay. earlier days, uh, for sure. But as of late, I've try to not speak so yeah. bluntly. I have not noticed of late. I'll, I'll be more attentive. Now, Father Corman, you got to wrap this up. Our uh, 10 minutes of time has long gone past. Oh, yeah, but I mean, I don't think these things should be only 10 minutes long, but nonetheless. Well, okay. But we disagree on, on length, too. So you <laughs> want to wrap this up or you want to offer sure. another uh, insight? I, I think, at least for me, um, I think both myself, uh, both Ks in this encounter, certainly are not arguing for a theocracy, but we're trying to say that really religion uh, informs our politics, and um, I think it's so important. And, and to close with that beautiful quote from Augustine, in essential things, unity. In non-essential things, liberty. And in all things, charity. Charity. I would just conclude with the same uh thought, uh, I don't know that we need religion to be a, a part of a, the arsenal of debate and uh, rancor, but rather uh, a calming experience that will allow uh, humans to reason together uh, and hopefully uh, to love together. God bless you guys. I hope this first episode has been fruitful, entertaining, uh, insightful, and helpful. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Again, this will be the, this is uh, posted on my uh, Father Glenn Corman YouTube channel, and we'll see how it goes. God bless. Glory to the Father. And Amen. To the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Well, thank you for watching, and I think we can all look forward to many more discussions of fire and ice. <laughs> <laughs>